Good morning, Crossmore. How are we doing today? Good. For those of you who are wondering, like, my name is Matt, and I am actually the campus pastor at our Ventura campus, and I'm excited to be down here today. Um, I actually spent five years here at Cross Point, uh, leading up to a year and a half ago when my wife and I made the move north, and just so good to be back and see a lot of old friends and kind of get to an opportunity to connect and just share what's happening uh, up in Ventura. And so if you'd like to connect after the service, I'll be in the glass room. I would love to, uh, you know, talk your ear off about just the cool things that God is doing and the lives that he's changing a hundred miles north from here, and it's still part of our church family here at Cross Point. So I'm excited about that. But we're also continuing in our series, Jesus Hope for Humanity. And so let me just let me just give us some context here for a second. You know, 2,000 years ago, they never intended to write the New Testament. See, so what happened is Jesus had died on the cross. He had gone into the grave. And before he had gone back up into heaven, he told everybody, hey, hang on, because I'm coming back. Now, they took that to mean, like, he's coming back, you know, before 3 o'clock this afternoon. And what happened is those hours turned into weeks. Those weeks turned into months. Those months turned into years. And Jesus still hadn't come back. And there was no need to, to write down everything that he did when you just assumed he, he's going to be back, you know, before, you know, the next season of Stranger Things starts up. Like, that was, that was their thought process. But then over time, those eyewitnesses and the people who had been there to see it and to feel it and to touch it, they began to die, some of old age, others because they were martyred, others as they just passed on into different life circumstances, until eventually one of Jesus' followers who had been there and seen it said, we need to record what we saw. But he was probably illiterate, so he grabbed his friend Mark, and Peter would then give the stories, and the moments to Mark, and he wrote them down. And then another one of Jesus' followers, a, a guy named Matthew, who was a Jewish tax collector, who had been there and part of the inner circle. He said, yeah, you got a lot of it right, but, but there's some pieces that you're missing. And he wrote a letter specifically to his Jewish brothers and sisters trying to show them that Jesus was the Messiah they had been waiting on. Then another a guy named Theophilus, a very wealthy follower of Jesus, said, I've heard the stories, I, I've, I've heard it all secondhand, but I want to see it all together. And so he hires this, this intelligent physician by the name of Luke to go out and do this investigation and to do the hard work of assembling all of the eyewitness stories. And he laid it all out into his account and he brought it back to Theophilus. But there was one other person. The guy that the Bible actually referred to as John the Beloved, which really means he was Jesus' best friend. He sat down and said, I, I also want to write my account, and it's going to be different than yours. See, his goal was to really show and to prove that Jesus had been the Son of God that everybody had suspected. So here we are, 1,900 years later, also looking back at these four stories, and this morning we are going to focus in and hone in on John's account of Jesus' life in our series, Jesus, Hope for Humanity. But before we even jump into the Bible, I just want to ask this question to everybody in the room and everybody watching online. Um, have you ever just wondered, like, how am I going to do if there's ever an emergency? Like, have you ever just wondered, like, how, how am I going to do? Maybe it's, maybe it's like all the disaster movies that I watch, or, or maybe it's just all the countless hours I spent just contemplating the zombie apocalypse. But I just kind of wonder, like, how would I do? And I know it's in vogue to pretend that I would be one of the survivors, but I'm just going to tell you right now, I give myself three days tops, okay? Like, it's, it's not lasting very long. I mean, first of all, my eyesight is terrible. You know, as soon as I get past the time where I can just, like, you know, soak my contact lenses in some solution, I am done for. If I'd been born a thousand years ago, I would be that weird blind family member that was like, he's out there talking to the trees again. Like, that would be me, because, like, I, I cannot see. Like, my wife in bed will sometimes say, hey, look at this and show me your phone. I have to grab it and it's like this far from my face because I can't see it otherwise. Okay, so like that's one reason. Another thing I think about is I've reached a point in life, and I know this might seem hard to believe, but um, I've reached a point in life where if I move too fast all of a sudden, like my back hurts for the next week. You guys with me? I helped a guy move yesterday. I can't lift my left arm above my head and I, I don't plan on doing it. Like I just know that if I'm out running like a zombie, it's not, it's not gonna work. Um, I've also reached a point where uh, I, I'm legitimately addicted to caffeine. Anybody else with me on this one? Anybody else there? Okay, thank you. You know, think about this for a minute. 
how am I supposed to live off the land if I have to stop at a Starbucks every four hours, right? <laughs> it's just, it's not, it's not going to be good. And then here's probably the biggest one, like kind of a recent thing. Since I've moved to Ventura, I have completely lost my ability to operate in less than ideal weather, okay? Uh, if it's below 60 degrees, I'm, I'm done. But you guys get that. You're Californians. You're not, you don't do well in cold weather either. But here's like the new wrinkle for me. If it's above 80, I'm just like, let's shut it down for the day. We'll, we're going to pick it up tomorrow. We're going to try, and maybe, maybe we'll make some progress on this project. But guys, it is 82 degrees. Nobody can do work in this weather. Let's, <laughs> let's go home. So I just know that about myself. I'm not making it, all right? You can have my stuff. Just know where, you know, you, I, if, there's, if the world falls apart tomorrow, it's yours, okay? Because I'm not making it out of it. Um, but I've been thinking about this a lot more recently because um, my backyard recently, uh, recently became the start of a really cheesy 1960s scary movie. A, a B movie, if you will. So I, I just want you, this is, this is actually what happened in my backyard a couple weeks back. And um, I don't know if you can hear it, but that buzz, that is like 25,000 bees that all descended on my backyard at any given moment. And you might be wondering, like, how did you let 25,000 bees all show up in your backyard at the same time? Guys, 15 minutes, there was no bees, suddenly there was that. Now, I, this is, I'm not a bee scientist, and not that anybody was going to accuse me of being one. Um, but here's what we found out, is that a hive split, the queen moved into our trash can in the backyard, and all of the other bees followed. And ever since then, I've just been thinking, if I had been born 50 years earlier, like before Yelp, I don't know what I would have done. Like, I think we've just been like, Jen, we got to move. Like, we got to move. There's nothing else we can do. The bees have moved into the backyard. It's not our house anymore. Maybe, maybe a beekeeper will be interested in our property, and um, we, can, we can try that. Uh, so I, I, I think about these things, but here's another reason why I kind of bring this whole topic up, is that also recently I've been wondering, how would I do in a spiritual emergency? Like, what would I do in a spiritual emergency? Um, and the reason why this is, this is something that's on my mind is that recently there have been some very famous Christian authors and musicians who have been very open about a struggle and a crisis that they're having in their faith. Um, some of which have said, you know, this is something we're going through. Maybe we're going to get out of it. Others saying, no, we're done. I'm done with Christianity and we're moving on. And the reason that rocks me a little bit is because I see them, I hear the words that they're saying, and I, I've read the things that they did in the past, and I think, man, their, their faith was just so rock solid. And if, if they can struggle through something, who, who am I to, like, withstand a crisis or an emergency in my faith? Who am I to, to get past this? Like, if I can just be transparent for a moment, like, these are some struggles that, that sometimes I have, like, questions that pop into my mind that I don't always have an answer for. Like, sometimes I wonder, if I had been born in a different part of the world, to a different family, where Christianity was not as widespread and not so part of the culture, would I still be a follower of Jesus? Sometimes I wonder, like when a doubt slips into my mind, is this just something like I hope is true, or is this something I actually believe? Every now and then I find myself just struggling through, like how are there so many variations in Christianity? Like how, how is it that we all look at the same passages, but we, we kind of pull these different conclusions? And sometimes it, it rocks me. There's another thing, that, another wrinkle to this that, that maybe you can ask yourself is, what is the line in the sand that has been drawn that you've said, God, I'll give you everything up until this point? Because, you know, we talk about complete and total surrender, like, oh yeah, God, you can just have my whole heart. But most of us have never been pushed into actually giving everything away. Because for most of us, following Jesus means I'm going to give up 90 to like 250 minutes every single week to come to church. I'm not going to listen to Jay-Z anymore. I'll, I'll pick Lecrae. Um, <laughs> and then like if I'm, if I'm really like Navy SEAL level Christian, I'm going to give a part of my, of my income away to, to the church. But like there's this line that we might not even be aware exists, but we've basically told God, you can have everything up until this point. And if God ever pushes you over that line, are you thinking like, yeah, God is still God and God is still good? So like tomorrow, if your boss were to call you into his office and say, hey, this isn't working out, um, you're done. Do you have what it takes to withstand something like that? 
Okay, what if, what if you have a very close family member die, like one of your parents, brother or sister, unexpectedly? Like this is, there was no reason to believe that they should die, but car accident, something like that, cancer. Are you still, are you still saying God is still God, God is still good? If your child were to die, is that going to push you over the line and make you question everything in your life? Like, these are just some of the thoughts I have, because up until this point, like, God hasn't thrown me over that line. I've had small, minor issues, but I haven't had a full-fledged emergency. And I wonder, can I make it? Can I do it? So, like, today we're in Jesus' hope for humanity, but i got to be honest with you, that today is a little bit more about Jesus' hope for my sanity. Because I struggle with these thoughts, and I know you do too. And so this morning we are in John's account, his 10th chapter. And so if you want to open there today, if you brought your Bible, just open it right to the middle, start going to the right. Eventually you're going to hit what's called the New Testament. This is the fourth book in the New Testament. If you have a smartphone with you, you can start scrolling down to the bottom third of books. Um, and eventually you're going to hit the book of John. And we're in the 10th chapter and we're going to read the first nine verses. And um, here is my goal for this morning, is that I hope that as we read through this, Jesus' words uh, reported by John will give you hope, it will give you resiliency, it will give you just comfort that, that you can withstand even one of the worst of storms. And so let's read the first five verses. Uh, this is John 10, 1 through 5. It says, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. Like I said, very comforting. Let's pray and uh, I think we can be done for, for the morning. Um, okay, not really. Because you're probably in the same boat that like everybody else is when they read this for the first time. And in fact, you're probably in the same boat that this, the first people, the first group of people who ever heard this were in. Because uh, John actually puts in the very next verse, those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So if you're, if you're in that boat right now, you're in good company. Like even the Bible people are like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's break this down. Like, and let's kind of start with here. Uh, you might be wondering sometimes, why does the Bible talk so much about sheep? You know, like it shows up a lot in the Psalms, like, the, you know, David was a shepherd, you know, Jesus, you know, when he was born, shepherds are like the first there, you know, we, we get all that. But I don't know about you, I've never even met a shepherd. Like, I don't know, is that an option when you fill out the census form for like occupation? I don't know, like that might be a thing. I, but for me, I have zero context for this. But it was crazy, even, even you know, 2,000 years later in the Middle East, shepherding is still a big deal. And although the people who heard this for the first time, they didn't connect the dots on like, what is the spiritual application to shepherding? They knew exactly what Jesus was talking about as far as sheep and shepherds are concerned. That part was not a mystery for them. There was a universal level of connection. So like for today, if I wanted to connect with you, like in a universal way, I might say, hey, let's talk about iPhones for a second. And I believe that if Jesus were here, he would also talk about an iPhone. Why? Because his ways are perfect. So sorry, Android users. Um, <laughs> But I'm fairly positive, Jesus, he was texting in blue. Am I right? Like, that's just how it is right there. So he might have actually said this if he were here teaching us today. Hey, guys, let's be real for a moment. Anybody who has to hack their way into a phone is a thief and a robber. Am I right? Because the person who actually owns the phone, when they hold it up, the camera recognizes their face and it unlocks. The actual owner of the phone can say, hey, Siri, and she responds. Now, let's not fool ourselves. She's still not going to understand what you said, but that's not on you. That's on Tim Cook. <laughs> she'll, at least, she'll at least respond. And the owner of the phone, he knows where every single app is. He knows where, what, what app is in which folder, which folder is on which page. You can find it. And why? Because he owns the phone. Like, if you understood what I'm talking about, like, that's the same universal level of connection that Jesus' crowd understood all this about shepherding 2,000 years ago. And so let me catch us all up to speed because we need to understand a little bit about the shepherding world for this to make sense. So back in this day and age, the shepherds, what they would do is they would build these stone walls around their courtyard, and they would put one entrance at the front, 
that all the sheep would enter and exit from. And as a more cost-effective way, they would, they would make a deal with their neighbors to where they would all use the same pen to hoard all of, their, all of their sheep. And so you might have one pen, but multiple flocks all inside. And the way it's supposed to work in an ideal world is that, you know, for us, most of our shepherding context comes from, like, the movies. And for most of the time, it's like cowboy movies. And in cowboy movies, you have a guy on a horse with a dog, and they're trying to push the livestock, or they're trying to push the sheep from behind. But in the Eastern world, that's not how it works at all. See, what happens is the shepherd would spend so much time with his flock that they would hear his voice, and they would memorize it, and they would recognize it. And so the shepherd would never have to, like, walk into the pen and be like, oh, this one's mine, oh, this one's mine. He could just stand out in front of the entrance, in front of the gate, and call his sheep out. And one by one, they would leave the pen until they joined him, and he could lead them from the front as they followed. Like I said, though, this is an ideal situation. And the circumstances and the situation that Jesus describes in this analogy is anything but ideal. Because one of the very first words that comes out of his mouth is that we understand thieves and robbers are not using the gate. They're coming over the sides. In fact, he goes on to explain it even more in verse 7. He says, So explain to them, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Okay, just so you know, we're going to tackle this whole gate thing in just a moment. But I want to really lean in and focus on the thieves and the robbers for a second. Because here's the big statement that Jesus is making. Not everybody that's in the pen is a friend. Not everybody that's in the pen is a friend. See, here's the deal. Not everybody has your best interests at heart. There are people who are competing for your thoughts and for your mind. Some are easy to spot, but for others, it takes a little bit more investigation. So Jesus, he gives the litmus test. He says, you know, the goal of a thief and a robber is to steal, to kill, and destroy. But more importantly, they don't go through the gate, which means they don't really care about Jesus. But I need to make a distinction here for a second. Because Jesus uses the words thieves and robbers. And for me, at least... I, can, I see those as completely synonymous. A thief is a robber, a robber is a thief. But in the original language, those two words meant two completely different things. So like for the way it would work for them is that um, you might be able to easily spot a robber because they're up front. They, they are beating their way into the pen. But thieves, on the other hand, they use stealth. They sneak in, they're hard to spot, they stay quiet the whole time. And here's why this is important to understand. Because you're probably going to easily see who the robbers are in your life. They're the ones who are up front that you don't need a God. They're going to say Jesus was a fake. They're going to bombard you with all sorts of facts and philosophy and arguments, just trying to convince you over and over and over, like, you don't need God. Like, this is, this is your Facebook friend that's like a militant atheist. All right? I'm not talking about like the run-of-the-mill run atheists that just, you know, quietly and discreetly just keep that to themselves. I'm talking about the ones who love to jump on any kind of argument or debate online about why there's so many different uh, contradictions in the Bible and how, you know, God is just as valid as a spaghetti monster in the sky. Like, we all have those friends. We know them. And it's like, we get it. You don't like Jesus. Like, let's, we, we understand where you're coming from. But the thing is, it's obvious in those situations. Like, you know who they are. If you confront a robber, they're just gonna, like, they're just gonna beat you down. But thieves, on the other hand, they can be harder to spot. Practically speaking, they might even use Jesus' name in conversation, and you're gonna think, well, yeah, I mean, like, I, I believe in Jesus. Like, I, I get that. But if you listen a little bit further, you find out that there's way more to it than that. That they'll say, you know, it's, it's Jesus plus something else. It's, it's Jesus plus following all these rules. It's Jesus plus sending your money to this leader. It's, it's Jesus, it's plus this other belief system. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna marry these two together. And they come in acting like they're friends and like everything is good, but in the end, their motivation is still to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And here's something I just want to make sure that I say right off the bat. I, my goal in this is not for you to look at any person who is not a Jesus follower with suspicion or skepticism that they're out to like trying to like destroy your life because that's not, that's not necessarily true. But at the same time, I don't want you 
to believe and be naive enough to think that everybody out there is all for us. That there's nothing to worry about. That everybody that's in the pen is a friend when that's just not the case. You know, it's kind of like, have you ever had like an old friend from high school or from college call you up or like message you out of the blue and saying like, hey, let's get together. I'd really love to catch up with you. Just so they can sit you down and be like, hey, you know what? If you join my sales team, you know, you can lose 40 pounds, you can make six figures. And, and you're like, wait a second. Like you, you trick me here under like the disguise of friendship, but you actually have like secret motivations. That is the corollary for what we're talking about. This is the equivalent. And this is so important to state because the equation is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And anything minus Jesus is nothing, which is why he says in John 10, 9, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. It's only through Jesus that you get to God. We have real enemies who are trying to destroy us, but it's through Jesus that you can be saved. And when you're part of his flock, he leads you to good pastures. And as Christians, this is what it's all about for us. See, like if we, if we whiff on everything else, but we get it right on Jesus, there is still hope. Our core value of evangelism starts off with, we believe Jesus is the hope of the world. It's a very narrow path. It's not inclusive. It's not a popular opinion. However, it's essential that we make this the drumbeat of our faith. So, but what does this all have to do with a faith emergency? How is any of this comforting? Well, Jesus said he was the shepherd, and a sheep, they recognize his voice. The thieves and the robbers, they are coming. They're sneaking in. They're going to stir up every doubt, every fear, every worry that you've ever had about faith. But remember, no matter what their proximity is to you, we were promised not everyone in the pen is a friend. And if you're really part of Jesus' flock, you're going to hear his voice. Jesus' voice will cut through the noise, it will cut through the chaos, it will cut through the confusion, and it'll stick. If you're part of Jesus' flock, you were designed to hear his voice. So in the middle of a pen when there's all these different voices and it just feels like some of your sheep buddies are going off in different directions and it's just so confusing and chaotic, his voice will still cut through everything. And why? Because you hear what you're listening for. A few years back, I was asked to give like the talk to a group of high school boys, which is like my favorite thing on the planet. Um, but I was, um, I was asked, I was asked to like give this, give this talk and as the speaker is introducing me, I'm noticing nobody is paying attention to him. And like, they're all on their phones, they're talking to each other, you know, they're playing games, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm like, I gotta get their attention. I know what'll get a group of teenage boys' attention. So I just walk up to the stage, I go, sex. And every single boy, I mean, is like, what now? Like, they set their phone down, like, they kind of lean in, like, tell us, like, yeah, well, what, do you, what, do you, what do you got? You know, and so like, I don't know what they expected to hear, but <laughs> you hear what you're listening for. You hear what you're listening for. As followers of Jesus, we hear his voice and we recognize it, even in the most chaotic of settings. And that's why joining a growth group is one of the most important things that you can do in your faith. Because some of you have not been a follower of Jesus very long, or maybe you have, but you don't really fully, completely understand what he sounds like. I'm going to tell you right now, if you join a growth group, this is one of the best next steps you can take in understanding what Jesus sounds like, to get around other people who are followers of Jesus and spend time every single week uh, concentrating on what Jesus said. You will grow in a way that you've never grown before, and you will listen and understand Jesus' voice in a way you've never heard before. So even if you just completely check out for the rest of my talk this morning to sign up for a growth group, I'm okay with that because I think it's that important in your life. But what do you do about the doubts? What do you do when you grow up in a Christian home and like you've heard all of the theories and thoughts your whole life. And then you get to college. And maybe for the first time, you're not getting pat cliches or, you know, that circular reasoning that, that you got in Sunday school. And somebody starts to make a lot of sense. And they start to make you really question, do I really believe what I think I believe? 
Can you withstand that kind of storm, that kind of chaos? What happens when you start to wonder if all of this is just emotions? Like you used to come to church and you loved the music and it was exciting and the teaching, it just seemed so rich and like interesting and new, but then you kept coming and it just seemed dry and not that interesting and you just kind of kept checking your watch, seeing how much longer do we have to get through this? And you start having the thoughts of like, you know, when I was, when I was a teenager, I liked Beverly Hills 90210 and I, that was a phase. Is this whole church thing also a phase? Like, it, is this on the same level? You know, when I lived, um, well, some of you didn't know this, but I used to live in Korea, and I was an English teacher there, and uh, if you can imagine, I didn't speak Korean uh, when I got there. And those first several months especially, everywhere I went, it was just noise. People would be having like, these big conversations, and I didn't understand any of it. I would be on the street, and I would hear music, and I would hear the automobiles going by, and it all just created this dissonance that was deafening. And it didn't matter where I was, I just didn't know what was being said around me. And nothing could get my attention, and it was like I was walking all by myself, even surrounded by thousands of other people. But on these rare occasions, I'd be going through a department store, or I'd be in a restaurant, and then I would hear it. And it would get my attention. And it didn't matter how much other noise was around me. When I started hearing English spoken... I immediately stopped what I was doing, leaned in, and said, where's that coming from? Why? Because that's my first language. And when I'm in a world that only speaks English, it's hard to always catch. But when you remove yourself from it, and there's chaos and confusion everywhere, as soon as you hear the words that make sense to you, it pierces through every other sound, every other confusion, every other single ounce of dissonance. Life can be loud and be chaotic. But when somebody speaks my language, it makes sense. But do you know what he sounds like? I worry about this for a lot of people. Because I think a lot of us, we know about God. We know of Jesus. But we don't really know him. I recently read a stat that said that 55% of self-proclaimed Christians can't identify the first four books in the New Testament. And the reason why that's so telling, and just so you know, if if you're like brand new to this whole church and God thing and you don't know that, there's no shame on that. Like, you're exactly where you need to be, okay? But for people that have been following Jesus for 20, 30, 40 years, the first four books in the New Testament are the ones that tell the story of Jesus. And I think all too often, we know philosophies about him, but we don't actually know him. And so we'll make statements like, Jesus is loving, which is completely true, but is a reduced down philosophy. Do you know how he has defined love? Do you know what his character is like? Like, can you say Jesus is loving and understand what it means and then read a story in the Bible about Jesus going into the temple with a whip and like whipping people and like throwing the tables over? Or there was one time when all these people needed healing They were sick. They had handicaps. Like they just, they needed something. And Jesus says, I don't have time to heal you. I got to move on to the next place. See, when you only know the philosophies about him, it's like, oh my gosh, how do I reconcile these things? But it's totally different when you know him and you can recognize him and his voice. A few years back, my, um, my family took a vacation down the California coast, and we stopped in Morro Bay, and we seen this really cute bed and breakfast. It was, it was great. And there was just one thing that was really funny to me. Um, on the wall was a picture of a person with the statement, I really enjoyed my stay in the garden room, and then it had the name underneath, Matt Damon. In fact, I got a picture right here. Just, you know, that is not Matt Damon, Okay. I've been following his career from school ties through the Martian. I'm just going to tell you right now, kind of looks like him, but that's not him. Some of you are like, is it? I don't know. Like, maybe. I'm just going to tell you right now, that, that is not Matt Damon. But at some point, some person like, hey, I think that's him. Like, they just start having that conversation. They don't really know him. They don't really know what he looks like. So this guy will do. So they take a picture and they put it up on a wall somewhere. And I'm scared that so often this is what we do for Jesus. That anybody that kind of says anything closely resembling something that we think he would say, we just say, that's him. That's it. That's right there. That, that must be right. 
The only way you get to really understand what he sounds like and what his heart looks like is by spending time with him, hearing his voice. See, the way it works is those sheep, they would spend every single day with their shepherd. And so when he would speak to them and call them out from the pen, they recognized his voice and they followed See, what's going to happen is at some point in your future, there will be some doubt, there will become some seed of confusion and chaos that's going to creep into your mind. That maybe you get shoved across that line in the sand. And you're going to start wondering, like, why do I believe what I believe? Is this all true? And in those moments... If you're relying on yourself to get through it, you will fail. However, if you can stop, pause, and listen for the voice of Jesus, it doesn't matter how chaotic, it doesn't matter how seductive, it doesn't matter how brutally violent the robbers and the thieves are, you will withstand it. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. When you're his, you're his. If things are going crazy around you, stop, pause, and listen. If your world is up in tomorrow, you can still find hope and comfort in Jesus, and things are going to be okay. He knows your name, and when you're truly one of his flock and he speaks, you hear it. And it comforts you, and it guides you, and it gives you hope. You recognize his voice.